people will do anything, no matter how absurd, in order to avoid facing their own souls. They will practice Indian yoga and all its exercises, observe a strict regiment of diet, learn theosophy by heart, or mechanically repeat mystical texts from the literature of the whole world, all because they cannot get on with themselves, and have not the slightest faith that anything useful could have ever come out of their own souls. A quote by Carl Gustav Jung. When I began to do my research on the mandala, I realized that I couldn't comprehend that was so inherently magical about these geometrical patterns. I mean, intellectually I knew that sacred geometry, like a puzzle, fits into the world. These patterns can be found in plants, animals, architecture, and people. Many religions and cultures devote their practices to mandalas. Intuitively, I knew there was something to it, but what? Why meditate on a mandala? When I read this quote from Carl Jung's collection of works, Alchemy and Psychology, it hit me. I was looking at a mandala. I was drawing a mandala. I wasn't looking for the mandala within. The word mandala comes to us from Sanskrit and means circle. In Hinduism, the word for mandala is yantra and literally translates to appliance or machinery. Now, Buddhism, Jainism, and Shintoism also use mandalas in their practices and religious ceremonies, and so do other Western traditions as well, such as Christianity has its own mandalas. And we can see those in a lot of the churches that still stand in Europe, or even in the new ones that have been recently built. Now, in Lamaic traditions, the word for mandal is hilkor, and it literally translates to the world wheel. Part of what it sets out to do is to demonstrate the importance of contemplation on the human ego. And the way that it does it is that it depicts three different animals in the center of the world wheel, in the center of the circle. One of the animals is the serpent to represent envy and jealousy, and then the other animal is the cock to represent promiscuity. And the third one is the pig to represent ignorance. In Tibetan Buddhist tradition, monks craft out a mandala to represent the universe. And they do this art out of, they make this art out of sand, they make this mandala out of colorful sand. And the process can take them days or weeks. Now, during a ritual, the mandala is destroyed and turned back into the particles of sand. And that particular ritual, that tradition, represents the impermanence of nature. Carl Gustav Jung studied mandalas, symbolism, archetype, dreams, visions, and the psyche and the unconscious, and somehow all of these were interconnected. In one particular dream, the dreamer was chased in a circle that indicated to Young that the dream must have had a center, as circles do. Clocks, targets, snakes eating themselves were all part of Young's study of dreams as the, these objects revealed themselves in the dreams of his patients and his own. Jung approached his research with an idea in mind. If we think of the psychological functions as arranged in a circle, as he did, then we might regard as the psyche having a circular shape as well. If one can find the center in the dream, 
the circular arrangement of dreams may reveal themselves. Now that makes you think, is Jung's theory correct? Is our psyche truly a circular shape? Is our subconscious, or rather the unconscious? Is it a mandala? In his 30 years of research, Jung discovered that the mandala, when you meditate on it or you draw it, always leads the eyes to the center. Just like life leads you towards wholeness, or as you like to say, individuation. Now, a good question to ask now, are our dreams leading us toward the center as well? And thus towards wholeness, individuation? To put our fractured parts back together? Well, Jung certainly thought so. The mandala is a representation of the universe. The sacred geometry holds within our daily routines or convictions or triumphs and failures or burdens our successes. But it is also the nature of the universe. It is the all-seeing eye that is watching you while you're watching it. Now, it would be impossible to make a video about all there is to know on mandalas, but if you're interested, what I would encourage you to do is to dive in deeper into research, and there are some books that I might recommend if you'd like to start learning more about the subject. Here are some books that I found valuable. There are more books out there, of course, but maybe one or two out of these will pick your interest. Mandala by Laurie Bailey Cunningham is a gorgeous book that covers all the basics. It's got shapes and arithmetics of the universe and their meanings using gorgeous examples or from nature and man-made architecture and art. If you're more arithmetically and geometrically inclined, you might want to get your hands on the geometry of art and life by Martina Kika. Hope I'm saying that name, pronouncing that name correctly. For someone who wishes to read something more esoteric, The Ancient Secret of the Flower of Life by Jervala Melchizedek is a fascinating story that incorporates a version of the Earth's history from 14,000 years ago and what did Thoth had to do with all of it. Another geometrically oriented book with a lot of spiritual inclinations and meanings is The Power of Limits by Georgi Tocci. <laughs> this is a great book for anyone interested in the topic, but I feel like it will be a fantastic book for someone who's an artist and wants to dive in deep into understanding the sacred geometry. Another book or journey perhaps that is great for artists and meditators alike is How to Create Mandalas by Jessica Matsurkevich. God, I need to learn how to pronounce these names. I think the title here speaks for itself. Sacred Geometry is also a good book uh, by Robert Lohlor. And of course, Carl Gustav Jung was fascinated with mandalas and has recorded extensive information on the subject. Men and his symbol and psychology and alchemy by Jung both include some fascinating historical, spiritual, and psychological insights on the nature of mandala. Now, if you'd like to dive in even deeper into the nature of mandalas, you might want to try meditating on um, finding different ways to meditate on a mandala. I know of free that work really well and that will allow you to connect with the sacred geometries and to understand them a little bit more on different different levels. So the first one is is the meditation where 
You close your eyes and you imagine a mandala that resonates with you the most. It could be a simple circle if you'd like, when, if you're beginning, or a square or a triangle, or it could be a pattern like the flower of life, or any of the platonic solids representing earth, fire, water, air, and ether. You can imagine one of the following or memorize one that you found in literature or in a video before meditating. There's no right or wrong way to do this one. Now the second meditation is an open-eyed meditation. If you've never done one of these before, it could be very interesting to see what the difference is like between when you're meditating and you're really going within or when you meditating with your open eyes. And it can be very profound when you're focusing on a mandala pattern. As such, there's a plethora of meditations and videos on YouTube that fe feature a moving mandala. Again, you could also use a mandala that you found in a book or a print that inspires you. And you can also place it on your walls. Um, if you like, at least temporarily, and then maybe passing by a mandala every day might awaken something within you that lay dormant for years. The third and last way of meditating on a mandala that I, I think is, is drawing a mandala. It used to be Carl Jung's favorite way to understand understand these concepts and you also prescribe this method to his patients. Now, if you'd like something that is more balancing your nature, say you'd like to become more grounded or you like to open your third eye and start seeing the world from a different perspective, then you could incorporate the five elements as we've mentioned before, earth for grounding, fire for passion and ambition, air for thinking and contemplation, water for enhancing emotional intelligence, and heaven for higher and spiritual understanding and insights. The platonic solids is a good place to start with this end of war. If that is not for you, you could also draw a mandala intuitively and attempt an analysis of its meaning, if you like, once the drawing is complete. If you try any of these meditations for yourself and let me know what you think of mandalas in general in the comments below. And I hope to see you next time. Thank you.